Hello, everybody. Thank you. I want to speak today about the motion of small particles, very small particles, atoms, single molecules. If you look on the motion of particles, you might see something like this. They go in every direction with the same probability. They go left, right, back, forward. And this results in the motion you might know if they have enough thermal energy, if there is enough heat to move, of course, right? This is a very basic concept in chemistry. It's called microscopic reversibility. That for every process, there is a backward process. And in equilibrium, these two compensate each other. Now, in our research, we want to fight reversibility. We want to break this law. That means we want to let molecules go one way only, okay? In one dimension, in a controlled fashion. That means we have to break these laws of thermodynamics. We also want to be selective, like here, for instance, only the red ones move, the blue ones don't. How can we achieve that? Well, first of all, before we move them, we have to see them. Can you see single atoms and molecules? The concept of atoms is very old. It goes back to Democrat 2,500 years ago. And then it was debated about 100 years ago a lot by several people whether atoms, atoms exist or not. If, uh, Ernst Mach, a famous physicist, said, when they, because he was skeptical about this concept, and when they asked him, said, well, atoms exist, he said, have you ever seen one, right? People couldn't see atoms at that time. You cannot see them with an optical microscope. They're just way too small. The first man who saw an atom was Erwin Müller in Berlin in the 50s. He invented the field iron microscope. This made it possible to see atoms. But it's not very versatile. You have to use very specific materials for this. The real breakthrough came in the 80s when these two gentlemen, Binnig and Rohrer, they invented the scanning tunneling microscope. And this microscope is not a normal microscope, it uses a sharp tip. And this very sharp tip is very close to a surface, so close that it doesn't touch, but there is a quantum mechanical tunneling current flowing. And now you keep it at the same current, it moves over the surface. If you keep the current constant, it would move along the topography of the surface. You can see the topography of the surface. And you can even do this with single atoms, okay? a real atomic resolution of a surface. Now if you want to see atoms on a surface, we have a problem. Temperature is our enemy, because if we take an image like this, the atoms move all the time. They have just too much energy in them, right? People like Friedrich Asch in Munich, they use this to see chemical reactions going on very fast. Now, we want to control the motion. For us, the temperature is the enemy. We have to cool it all down. We have to go to minus 27 degrees C, roughly, so almost absolute zero, and then every motion is frozen out. They're all stable. We see the single atoms there. Okay, so can we, we can fix them, can we also control them? Can we place them where we want? Can we write with atoms? This is something that Don Eigler has really pioneered in the 90s. He was the first one to write with atoms. How do you do this? You take advantage of a very basic concept in physics, which are the forces between two atoms. Every atom would interact with every other atom, either attractive or repulsive. The repulsive one is the most basic thing ever. It's the reason why I stand here and you sit there. I could fall through the, through the stage. There's enough space between the atoms, but the Pauli repulsion hinders me. So there's always repulsion between two atoms. You know this, right? You could smash two objects together, and you know it's from, from intuition. You would damage one, the softer one, of course. Okay? This is Pauli repulsion. Now we can use that with the tip, and we repel a single atom over the surface and it hops away because repelled. And while we do that, we measure the current. And while we approach, the current increases and it jumps down when the atom hops. We can see directly the type of motion. We see it's a pushing mode, it's repulsive. We can also do it in the attractive mode. That means now the tip pulls the atom, and therefore we see a different signal, also sawtooth shaped, but inverted. Okay, so we can tell from the curve we get what happened with the atom. And we can tell it jumped from one lattice site to the next, a distance below one nanometer. By the way, one nanometer is a millionth of a millimeter. Is a 1,000 nanometers is a micrometer, for instance. OK, if we can do this, if we're experienced, and if we're careful and have patience, we can now write with atoms. And here, for instance, we wrote Graz, the place that was just mentioned, where we do our work. So when we do this systematically for many atoms and molecules, we find out that all of them hop over the surface. We wondered, could we roll a molecule? If we want to roll a molecule, we need upright standing wheels. 
So we take a molecule like this one that has two upright standing wheels. The idea is now that we push them and they should roll over the surface. There is one problem though, which is we cannot see the motion because if we do that, we take a single molecule, it consists of two bright lobes, like a dumbbell. We move the tip across, it moves on the surface. You can see afterwards it has moved, but we don't know what happened in between, just before and after. It looks exactly the same. In order to, to, to understand what's going on, we have to look on the current signal again. Right? So we measure the current signal during this motion. And for that, we get different curves. If you push it more in the center, we get pushing and pulling curves, so the wheels jump over the surface. If we push it more towards the end, we get more torque, and then the wheels are truly rolling over the surface. We get this typically sombrero-shaped signal, and this tells us that now this was a rolling motion, because it reflects exactly the motion that it would do. This is very interesting to us. It means that maybe we can construct nanomachines with wheels that can overcome obstacles, for instance, Right? Things are very different on a scale, not like here. Gravitation doesn't play a role. Electrostatic force is very important. So things are very different, but maybe we can construct new things with this. If we speak about wheels and motion, well, a very basic concept comes into your mind. Maybe the cars, the already mentioned cars. You know this, we in Stuttgart, you know cars, you know motors. The very large motors, amazingly large, just seen them on the railway station of Stuttgart, and then they're very small ones. These are the ones that we are interested in. They're very, very small. They're very light, almost no mass. And this is what we're interested in. Can we understand what they do when they move? So the molecules we're using are these. They contain a motor unit that is called Feringa motor after Ben Feringa, who got the Nobel Prize in 2016 for the, for the synthesis of such molecules. It needs light and heat to rotate a rotor, and this rotor rotates only in one direction, very interesting to us. Now the question was, can we drive this on the surface? We have to illuminate the surface, because the molecule needs light. Now light is very advantageous here. It's remote, it's far away, the light source can be a meter away. It's clean, no chemical fuel on the surface or something. It goes in, it goes out, and that's it. And then you also illuminate a large sample. You illuminate a square centimeter or even more. So you illuminate billions and billions of molecules at the same time. But then you come with your microscope and look on one single molecule only. Okay? This is how we do this. We take images before and after we illuminate with different light sources. We can use different wavelengths, of course. And then we watch what has happened. We looked on the, on the difference image then and see a molecule has moved. And we see, therefore, that the light has truly lead, led to translation of these molecules on the surface. So the motor was active. We're very happy to see this, right? It's, a, it's truly a one single molecular motor, one nanometer in size that moves. Can we get more insight? Can we understand a little bit more about what's going on there? We have to do a little bit of statistics now. Don't be scared about statistics and data points, just two slides. We can measure the hopping rate. The hopping rate is the number of molecules that have moved per second. Surprisingly, you might say, this is equal for all the cases we've studied. It doesn't matter which light source we use or whether we use a light source at all. It's always the same number of molecules moving. Weird. Right? So this is just the thermal energy. The molecules move around, some of them, not very many, some of them. Now this is just information about the number of molecules that have moved. It doesn't tell us anything about the distance they have moved. If we want to see the distance, we have to do some statistics. We have to measure their pathways in 2D, and we get this value here. And now we see a difference. We see that the ultraviolet light sources, the low wavelength, they lead to larger dislocations. The molecules move because we switched the light on. They wouldn't do that. Now, if we put the two informations together, this is a very interesting information to us because it tells us, well, you supply heat, some molecules move, then you shine light onto the molecules, and only those that have moved before, they get a kick now, and they move further with the light. This gives us real insight into how such a molecular motor behaves on the surface, and we are really trying hard to let them move much farther. Graz, Stuttgart, for instance, who knows? A couple of years ago, we were invited to participate in the first nanocar race. That's a race 
with single molecules. I'd say it's rather a public outreach event, but more than science. But anyway, it raised two challenges that were very new for us. We've never thought about these before. The first one was speed. The only argument about the race is, of course, as you know, speed. You have to be the first in the finish line. That's it. We never think of speed. You know, if we're curious, if we want to answer a question, if we like something, we do this for years. We never stop because we think it's the most important question that we have. Now, it was different. We didn't have to care about the processes, the understanding. Just be fast, as fast as you can. Second, we had to go along a course, a racetrack, straight lines, curves, stuff like this. This is something, of course, we never do. It's not of interest to us. So these were new challenges, quite interesting at the end. The chemists, Jim Tour at Rice University, and we, with a long-standing collaboration, we have discussed different molecular types, right? Which one could be a very good, fast molecule? We came up with this molecule here. It's a very good design. It's the fastest molecule I've ever seen. And if we move that on a surface, we take the tip of the microscope, we apply a pulse, and it would, the molecule would jump underneath the tip. That's the way how we move it, right? Step by step. We place the tip here, the molecule follows. We place the tip here, molecule follows, and so on, and so forth. So far, so good. This is very nice. It's controlled. We can move it along a line, but it's slow. We have to take an image after each step. Every image takes maybe three to five minutes. That's very slow for the long course we have to do. So we thought, can we do it blind? Can we do it without watching the molecule, right? So we developed a new manipulation concept where we do it without watching. We just place the tip next to the molecule. We see the current signal. And from quite some studies we did, we know exactly what the molecule does if we see a certain current jump. We see translation and we see rotation. Now, if we do that, we don't have to take an image. We just see the translation, we stop, we do another one, we stop, and so on, without ever taking an image. We can move as far as 190 angstrom here without a single image on the way. And then at the very end, we look, we take an image, and we find it almost magically, I would say. This, is very fast. this was very fascinating that it works. We never did this before. So we were quite fast, we thought. We went to the Nanoka race, took place in Toulouse, 2017. This was the place where it took place. This was the control room. Cameras, it was live on YouTube. Six teams from Japan, United States, France, Germany, Switzerland, and us. You can see me discussing with our dear chemist colleague, Jim Tour. But the race really took place somewhere else. This was not the place. This was the place where we controlled the microscopes. Our microscope was in Graz, 1,500 kilometers away. It was just by internet. That's easy nowadays. Desktop control, right? You have the microscope somewhere else. This was the place where it really took place. This is our instrument. Two meters long, two meters high, lots of instruments, not so important. The important thing is the microscope. It's the size of my hand. And you might see the very small tip coming from above on a very small sample, a centimeter. And then in a very, very small area, 100 by 100 nanometers, less than one by one micrometer, there we run the race. Okay? This was our race. You can see the start molecules. We had two molecules at the start. Grant Simpson from my group, he did the first one. I did the second one, actually. And then we had to go overcome 50 nanometers straight, first obstacle, 50 nanometers, second obstacle, 50 nanometers, finishing line, and the first would win the race. Now, this is a movie. What happened? We, took, we did the manipulation. We took images on the way. So we could see how the molecule moves now down. It passes the first obstacle. It does a curve to the right, second obstacle. It took us a little bit close to the finishing line, but then we made it, and we finished within one and a half hours. <laughs> well, one and a half hours might appear long <laughs> to you. Actually, it is not. It was very fast. It was much faster than we thought we could ever do that. It's a long way for us. 150 nanometers is a long way for us. Normally, we work in two, three nanometers, right? It was so fast that we could win the race. So we got a 
distance of 150 nanometers done in one and a half hours, so 100 nanometers per hour. The second had roughly 20, 25 nanometers per hour, and the others couldn't even reach the finishing line within 29 hours. It's a very difficult process. We were lucky also, I must admit, right? Good molecules, everything went well. Many things can fail. So it was by far the fastest molecule that made us win the race. If you put this into relationship, 100 nanometers per hour, what is this? If you think about the growth of your hair, maybe your hair grows a tenth of a millimeter a day, 100 micrometer a day, 24 hours, 4 micrometer per hour, 4,000 nanometers per hour. That's the growth of your hair now. We had 100 nanometers per hour. It's f the hair is 40 times faster. If we could see the hair <laughs> in our movie, a huge, enormous thing, 100,000 times larger than the molecule would rush over the area, right? <laughs> but this was at minus 270 degrees C. Your hair would not grow at this temperature. <laughs> All right, so this is what we're working on. Now we try to make the next step, attach cargo, be controlled in what we do, and build up something bigger. Thank you very much.